all see that? Does that does that work good? You all see that? Okay, perfect. If at any point um, that you don't, please holler, say something so that we can know and then um, move forward. So really, you know, today, if you uh, read the description of it, there, these are some of the questions that we're going to be talking about, right? How can oral histories be used in museums and art galleries? What role can publications play in disseminating oral histories? How can we consider our audience when presenting oral history in public spaces? Where can we integrate participation and collaboration within our oral history projects? I probably will not be answering these questions directly, like question number one, and then an answer. But I think what you'll see is that as I talk about some of these projects and we share some of these projects together, that these are um, these are some of the questions that will be addressed, right? And a lot of what I'm hoping that we'll be able to do today is that we're gonna try to build a toolkit together. Um, in a second, I'm gonna give you a question for reflection. I'm then gonna share um, three or four projects that I've done over the past uh, decade um, to give some examples. And then we're gonna have an opportunity to go into breakout rooms together. Uh, some of you, that will be you'll be really excited about that. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, that's the last thing that I wanna do right now. And that's totally okay. There will be uh, levels of particip participation for everybody. Um, but then the hope is that from those breakout sessions, we can come back together and have a discussion. We can share out um, what has been meaningful to us uh, inside of oral history work, where we've encountered meaningful things, and learn from each other and hopefully walk away from today with a toolkit of sorts that we can implement inside of our projects. Some of you are oral historians deeply integrated in projects already. Some of you may be artists or just at the beginning of something, but everything that we're gonna talk about today, I hope that it has a use value to you in your own practice in the communities that you're working inside of. Um, I wanted to, you know, for the past 15 years or so, I've been trying to find ways for people to have meaningful engagements with story. Um, and a lot of this um, started for me actually at where OHA is now located at Baylor University. When I was an undergrad, I studied social work. And I remember towards the end of my time there, so like 2002 probably, um, there was a professor of mine in the social work department who was working on an oral history project. So I went to the Institute. I did like maybe like a two hour training and then did a couple um, of interviews. And so that was really my first introduction. I also just want to shout out um, a dear friend and mentor. I actually think of her more as like a tia, like an, like an auntie to me, but Suzanne Snyder, um, who many of you in the room probably know through oral history summer school. Um, I did oral history summer school a number of years ago, and that, um, that experience was really, really transformational to me. But I want to talk a little bit more about one person. This is where I really started to, I think, think about stories in oral history in a meaningful way. And there's an artist named Michael Nye who's based here in San Antonio. And Michael does um, long-term um, projects. They're not really documentaries, but they're photographs of people. And then um, what you can you kind of see some pictures here in the background, but then you see the photograph and you walk up and you put on a set of headphones and you push a button and you hear that person speaking in their voice um, about their life and about different experiences. The first project that Michael worked on um, was around teen pregnancy. The second project, multi-years, was around mental health. The third project, which Michael and I worked on for five years together, was around um, hunger and food insecurity. And his most recent project is on blindness and perception, which you can see this, this photograph here. When I worked with Michael for those five years on um, the project about hunger, um, we went to over 30 cities. We interviewed over 80 people. Um, for it. And um, I got to be in the room for almost all of those. Michael was very inclusive um, in the interviewing process. We would spend uh, about six hours interviewing people over a two to three day period. And then when we would come back to the studio, um, I got to do something that really changed my life and was really uh, challenging for me. I got to do all of the transcription. Um, and I don't know if you all have done transcription. It can be a really beautiful thing. But for me, it was incredibly challenging. I am a horrible typist. And there were days that I felt like my fingers were just gonna bleed <laughs> um, from it. I would hit play, I would type a little bit, I would back up a little bit, I would hit play again. And this process of doing about 80 interviews in this like five year span was incredibly transformational to me, really because it was a place that I fell in love um, with voice, with story. 
it wasn't so much, yes, it was like the, um, what people were saying, but a big part of it was how they were saying it, right? It was the pauses, it was the accents, it was the stutters, the starts, the, the way that people speed up when they get excited or the way that they slow down, right? When something is uh, maybe harder or they're having a difficult finding the words for it. I remember as part of the editing process, um, at the end of every transcription, I would go back through the audio and I would create a file of just breaths, of just people, right? Uh, just those breath sounds to potentially be able to use them as we took six hours of audio and brought it down to a four to six minute piece. And so I really am grateful for that time. But also I remember at the end of usually when uh, Michael would do this final edit and I would listen to it, I would find this thing inside of myself where I would be like, oh, like, I can't like the part, this one part didn't get included, right? There was no way to include the fullness of the interview inside of it. But the final edits were always about a way of how do you um, be true to somebody's story and also how do you paint that person in the best light? But that moment was really important for me because um, I saw a shift inside of myself of really wanting to work uh, with longer form and presenting more than sometimes less when it comes to audio and to our oral histories um, and even transcripts. And that is something that as you'll see in some of these projects that I continue to this day to wrestle with, right? How much do we include? How much do we put out? How much do we share? Thinking about our audience, right? And what is their level of engagement and the context that they're engaging it in. Um, also just wanna shout out uh, Michael Nye um, on his website now has a podcast. And I think that um, podcast is a very normal um, outlet for many oral histories that a lot of us are seeing these days. And so I encourage you to give that podcast a follow and to listen to some of that. Also, some of you, um, Michael is the partner of one of our national gems, the poet Naomi Shehab Nye, um, who's actually in this photograph right here, kind of walking through. But if you don't know the poetry of Naomi, um, I deeply encourage you to become acquainted with it. She is just a, an absolute a wonderful person. So, um, so let's let's go ahead and jump in. Um, but the first thing that I want to do is this is a question that I want to pose to you to share: um, is where have you had a meaningful interaction with oral histories? Why was it meaningful to you? And what I want to do is invite you to jot down some notes, um, some thoughts onto the paper. Don't drop it in the chat box just yet, okay? Um, but this is going to be the question that I'm going to invite you to 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 jump into or share into when we go into the breakout rooms. So where have you had meaningful interactions with oral histories and why was it meaningful? Again, hold off on the chat for now and um, we will be sharing that in the breakout room. I'm just gonna give us just a few seconds to get that thoughts down and then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in and start sharing. So you can even uh, add to this list as it goes on and memories jump back into you. Okay, um, the range of projects that I'm gonna share with you range from, from some that I have done with my family to others that I've done publicly in museums. And again, I just wanna bring us back to that idea of toolkit. So if there's anything that you see that is done inside of these projects that could be useful to you, you can go ahead and implement them into your own practice. You don't need my permission or anything like that to do it. I think that that freedom of, uh, of, of use with ideas is something that I'm really, really into and drawn to. So uh, this is a, a photograph of my grandfather, uh, Jose Antonio Font, Papa Joe, as we would call him. And uh, my mom's side of the family is Puerto Rican. And so this is his port card so that he could have a small um, boat when he was in high school. My grandfather, um, I love him a lot. He has since passed and that's part of this project. Um, but like a lot of human beings, I had a really complicated relationship with my grandfather. Um, there was a lot of things that were incredibly challenging inside of that. The last years of, um, of his life, he started to mail me photographs. He had photographed really intensely for about a 30-year period of his life. And I think it was his way of him beginning to, to, you know, ask questions about legacy and how you deal with that. And so I would get like an envelope with like 10 photographs. And then I would get a shoebox full of like a hundred slides, right? And these uh, boxes just kind of kept showing up and they included like, you know, some snapshots like this. Um, he's here in the middle. This is my grandmother uh, in Puerto Rico. But this is um, one kind of example. And then there was these other photographs, right? Um, they were a little odder, right? Um, this is my grandmother on the land bridge in Laredo 
Texas. Um, and this is actually the bridge that the other side of my family, my father's from El Salvador. And so my grandfather, Domingo, crossed this bridge um, in the early 40s. And so for me, there's a lot of meaning inside of this photograph. Um, but, you know, there's other ones like this that are just a little more that as I was going through that I found them to be a little more um, artistic, right, in this way of the of creative uh, expression from his side. When my grandfather um, finally passed, um, I was, you know, left with these photographs. And I was really thankful because the year before that, I had actually flown to Florida and done a six, six hours of interviewing with him over a three-day period. And when he passed, I started to ask myself, I was like, what, what can I begin to do with this? He was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And so there was about an eight-month uh, delay between when he passed and his funeral. And so what I ended up doing was I, I pulled together about 240 of the photographs that were there. And while I had them, I didn't know a lot of the context around them. He and I hadn't really talked about that. Um, and so what we did is the night before his funeral, I pulled my family together along with some friends and invited them to write directly onto the pages of this book that I had created, adding context to it and thinking of, you know, adding these layers of history that we didn't know. The primary audience for this book when I was thinking about it was my own family. My, uh, my uh, children at that time uh, were young. They were like two and four. And so thinking about how stories get passed along. So they began, family began to write onto the pages of this. Also, we did uh, a number of translations, uh, which this one is pretty hilarious. It really points to the complicated nature of the machismo of my family and my father. It says, uh, I'm sending this picture to the Institute of Tourism to use as propaganda. In this, you will see why they call me Handsome Joe. I'm not going to show you the front of it, uh, but it, pero, ay, 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 just, you know, some of those things. So we did a lot of translation inside of the book. Um, after the funeral, what I ended up doing was coming back um, to the studio here in San Antonio and pulling the book apart and relaying it out. And I worked with the incredible artist and designer Molly Sherman to design a new book. And this book um, had, you can see on the cover is the port card on the back of it is, um, is the back of the card, which has this fingerprint, which is kind of nice. Um, but then inside of it, there's about, you know, 200 pages of these photographs with the handwritten, um, you know, writing on it. And then there's, uh, here's some examples um, inside of that. And then there's a transcript in the back of that oral history. And this for me was one of those moments where I really started to think about the difference between the orality of oral history and then the transcript of it. And they're two different things. And an edited transcript, right, is even different than an original transcript. And an excerpt of audio is very different than the full audio. And an edited excerpt of the audio is very different, right? All of them can be used in different ways. But um, the last pages of this, um, were, you know, contained all of the oral history um, edited transcripts along with images that were embedded inside of it. I mentioned to you that the primary audience was my family, and so I got a small grant to cover part of the printing, and then um, family members chipped in, and we printed 50 copies of this book so that family members could have them. Um, as time went on a little bit, I was really drawn to some of the photographs in it as well, and an opportunity came at a museum in Austin, Texas, Austin, Texas called Mexicarte, which exists to, um, to really, um, yeah, um, bring forward Latinx um, art in, in the community. And so we did an installation of it. And the thing, you know, I thought that some of the images were really uh, compelling um, and beautiful and, you know, wanted people to begin to engage with the oral history, which you can see there's a dining room table put in the back and on the tabletop, people can engage with the book. But for me, one of the most interesting parts of this exhibition and most meaningful things for me is that um, several weekends throughout the run of the, of the show, we held community or family archive workshops inside of the space where we invited families from the Austin community to bring their own family archives in and we brainstormed and worked with them on potential projects that they could do. And so really this project in this context just served as an example, right, of what one can do with their own family archives and way that it can be shared out. Um, thank you, looking at these, moving forward. Um, the next project that I wanna share with you is, um, is called Northern Triangle. And for a moment, I want to invite you to kind of rewind in your brain back to 2014 and to think about what was so much of what was, uh, you know, filling the headlines at the time, right? We saw tens of thousands of uh, families, 
young unaccompanied children showing up at our southern border, right, seeking asylum, fleeing violence um, from the Northern Triangle, uh, from Central America. And I mentioned earlier, my father's from El Salvador. Um, I lived in El Salvador during the Civil War from 88 to the end of 90. Um, and so this was a, uh, an event and just time that really, um, yeah, just really made me pause. And uh, my friend, Mary Heathcott, who runs a museum here in San Antonio, reached out to Jason Reed and another collaborator, Aaron Dugan. We were working with Borderline Collective. And she said, you know, can y'all help us begin to try to understand um, what is happening? Can you try to find, create a space that we can begin to talk about this? And so what we did is we reached out to a number of artists and um, community organizations, including Raices and the South Texas Human Rights Center. And we created an installation that looked at US intervention in Central America over the past 100 years and how that relates to what's happening at the border. You can't talk about what's happening in the border in 2023 or in 2014 without talking about what has been going on for decades and centuries, right? And so we created this installation. Um, one of the things that I wanna, um, as, as I was thinking about it, here's another view of kind of this back room. And as we were thinking about it, I started thinking about the um, my local context, right? How San Antonio and in particular South Texas had been involved in this work for a long time. Some of you have heard, may have heard of the sanctuary movement, but it was a movement in the 80s of uh, churches and other people of faith and people not of faith, right? Um, helping individuals um, receive, um, get to safety, right? Provide sanctuary and help people along that way. Um, and for a long time, I had known that in San Antonio, um, uh, two people lived here, Stacy Merck and Jack Elder. And Stacy and Jack were the first two people that were actually convicted in federal court of crimes um, of helping to shelter people. Um, Stacy, they both did uh, prison time with Jack in a halfway house and Stacy um, in a federal prison. And I started to think about their stories and how important they were to, the, were to this work and to the, the context. And so I asked each of them if they'd be willing to sit down and to do record an oral history to be used in the space. They graciously agreed. And then when I started to think about how to activate it in this space, um, I really wanted the voice, their voices to be filling it. And so that you heard about these connections between the 80s and now inside of it. And so a strategy, instead of just using a normal speaker, I use these small little things that are called transducers, um, or some people call them exciters, and they're very affordable, uh, under $10 for most of them, and you connect them to an amp and you put them almost on any surface and it turns that surface into a speaker. And so this is put on the underside of the glass vitrines that are there and their voices fill the space. Um, I'm gonna jump back here. You can see also, these are the cases and so for the audio that was playing in it, instead of playing the full, you know, 90 minute interviews that they had, I uh, um, edited down to about a 30 minute um, clip from that um, to be heard in the space. But then also you can see these um, papers that are here on the top. I provided the full transcripts inside of the space so that people could engage with them in that way. And this is, I mentioned earlier, talking about like, how much do you show? How much do you withhold? How, what do you put into the public for people to engage with? And I remember this being one of those moments where I was really, really having to think through that because some of the longer audio pieces, um, just uh, it was it was just a lot to have in the space. So um, another thing that I forgot to mention, uh, one thing that was really important about the Northern Triangle exhibit, it ended up traveling to, to several venues, and which we'll talk about in a second. But we tried to offer the space to as many community groups as possible to use for their own purposes. So this is at... Um, this is at the Craner Art Museum, and this is a community group that's gathering to discuss ways that they can resist ICE um, interventions inside of their community. But this idea of community organizations coming in and bringing their own stories to that place was really a, a large part of the conceptual um, underpinning of this project. Um, at the, um, let's see here, let me move forward. At the opening of, um, of Northern Triangle, people kept coming up to me and saying, I came from, my family came from, my tío came from, right? And what they were doing is that they were sharing uh, their own migration stories with me. And it was in that time that I realized, right, that all of us have a migration story. Some are just closer than others. 
Some of those migration stories uh, we share with pride. Others of the migration stories are hidden by our families, and some of them are even stolen from us, right? And we don't even know what they are. And I believe that those migration stories have value, not just for our individual lives, but for our communal lives as well. And so coming from that, um, from that experience of the opening of Northern Triangle, I decided to start a new project, an oral history project called Migration Stories. And what Migration Stories does is invites people to respond to the question, where do you come from, which can be uh, a complicated question, right? If you ask it in one context, it can almost feel like a weapon, um, but in a context of care, it can be an invitation for people to begin to share. And so every place that Northern Triangle ended up traveling to, um, I ended up doing a, a workshop. And so uh, this photograph is from the University of Arizona in Tucson, um, but I didn't want to be um, the person, I, I'm always trying to counter extraction, right? How do we not be extractive inside of our processes? And so instead of me doing the oral history interviews, what we did is did an open call to students and community members in each place for people to come to a one day oral history workshop that I led. And so those people um, that came, usually students, also community members, but they're the ones who went through the training and then they, the next day or the next week, then turned and invited their own neighbors, their own community members to sit for oral history interviews. Um, sometimes those interviews happen um, inside of museum spaces like you're seeing here. So at the opening, people were going out into the museum to find a hopefully quiet spot um, to, to record those interviews. Uh, this is at the, um, um, the National Museum of Puerto Rican Art and Culture in Chicago. Um, worked with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago with um, PhD and MFA students there. They're the ones that went through the training and then did the oral histories in the Puerto Rican Museum uh, the next week. Um, and then also we worked in places that are outside. This is the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, we had the exhibition in, at the Craner, but decided to not work inside of the institution, but to work in open air spaces. You can see there's two groups that are recording here. Um, Thankfully, that project ended up working in six cities. We did seven iterations of it. There's 238 participants that are people that participated in the project. And then from those 238 participants, there were 71 countries that were kind of tied back to or referenced. And as we begin to think about how to get this out into the community, um, I love making books. Um, I love books just in general, but so gravitated towards making publications for this. And we made a separate publication for each one of these books. Again, on this, I got to work with the amazing designer, Molly Sherman, um, who provided a great, great structure for everything that's there. Um, one of the things that was really important is that we only printed about um, 250 copies of each one of the books. But the first place that half of the books got distributed was back into the community in which the, um, the work was made. So we tried in each one to do some kind of event, which I'm going to talk about here in just a second. Um, this happened at the beginning of the pandemic, so some of those events ended up needing to shift to being remote. But that idea of distributing the work back into the community in which it was made first was really, really important for this project and something that's really, really important for my own practice. Um, this is just a, a little insight. Some of the books have um, are just kind of what we would think of traditional, you know, edited transcripts. And so you can begin to read and see that one of the design things that I love that in each uh, the beginning of each one, there's this line and the line represents um, a territory or border that comes from the conversation of a crossing of those things. Um, and and so one of the design elements. One of the iterations that we did was here in San Antonio at um, a place called an uh, artist residency called Art Pace. And I worked with the, the team, they had a team program. And so there was about 12 or 15 teams and worked with them over a four week period. So we did an oral history uh, workshop. And then each of the, the youth was invited to do two interviews, one with a family member and then one with somebody who they did not know before. And a lot of them chose to work inside of the institution. And then um, as a way to activate those, instead of doing kind of traditional transcripts, what each of the youth did is they wrote a summary of that oral history. And I think there can be something really beautiful at that process, right, of writing a summary and who may become interested in that. And then for the public event, which you're seeing a photograph here, what each youth was invited to do was to select an audio excerpt for like three to five minutes from one of their interviews and then they got up, they read their summary of that 
played the three to five minute uh, and then and then played the three to five minute audio excerpt. Um, you can notice that there's a, a table in the middle of the room here. It's blank right now because this was at the beginning, but the invitation to other people in the room was that as they were listening, if they heard anything that resonated with them, that rubbed up against their own story or that they wanted to share, they could get up and come and write directly onto that paper. And what ended up happening through the night was this beautiful conversation emerge, a silent conversation, right, of written words that were there. Um, this for me has honestly been one of the greatest, I mean, one of the most meaningful um, moments for me inside of doing some of this work because there was a lot of family members in the room. Everybody that came got a copy of the book and then books were set aside to distribute back to the other narrators inside of the project. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the other ways um, that that I work inside of this project because I think that they were meaningful and as we're talking about toolkit, these could potentially be helpful as we move forward in future projects. Um, another one of the sites was actually a public high school here in San Antonio, and it was called the um, the high school was the International School of the Americas, um, not the training place. Um, but um, at ISA, it was a, you know, it's a smaller high school, a few hundred students, but they're nestled inside of or located inside of a larger um, high school. And so we had about 60 students from ISA from a, um, a history class and then 60 students from an ESOL class, English for Speakers of Other Languages. And they came together for a three day workshop. On the first day of the workshop, what we invited people to do was to to collectively create a set of questions that they could go home to talk with their families about, uh, about their own migration stories. And so they did that. And then on the second day, they came back together. And this is what they're doing here is actually sharing out what their responses were, what they learned from their families about their own migration stories. And then on the third day, we were supposed to come back together and to create these um, collaborative written pieces together that we're going to then go into the book. But on that second night um, was the um, election where Trump um, came to the presidency. And so when we came back together on the third day, we decided that what was needed more was space for processing. And so instead of doing the collaborative written pieces, we were able to share with each other and communally, collectively decided that the book that we would, that we would produce was just the book of questions that was generated on that first day. And then we would offer the book to the community as a way to start, as a starting point for their own conversations with family members. Um, another um, place that I worked was um, Washington and Lee University in Virginia. Um, uh, they have a great um, art space there and I really appreciate the art faculty. And so uh, Northern Triangle was installed there and we didn't have time or resources to be able to do a full migration stories workshop. So what we ended up doing, or I ended up coming up with this prompt where I invited everybody to write down, um, uh, make a list of every place that they had ever lived. And then adding on to that, writing down every place that their parents had ever lived. Right and and kind of merging the two together, it's a kind of a hard uh, thought process or exercise to do. And then adding on to that, every place that their grandparents had ever lived, great grandparents, great great grandparents, going as far back as possible. And then we took some time to stop and reflect on that in between each location on that list, there existed a migration story. And so then people paired up from there, um, and then were able to share out one on one with people. Um, what those migration stories were, were, and then we came back together to then share out with the larger group. And I think this is like, it became this really um, meaningful exercise to do together, right, to realize where we, you know, what the stories are in our lives uh, generationally, and how are we creating meaning from them now. This has still been a, a process that I've worked on um, with communities. Most recently, I've done an iteration of this with students um, at, in Laredo, um, also at Texas State University, where they make that list, which you can see the list here on the left. But then we end up doing a more focused kind of writing exercise. And so while we, yes, we do share out um, verbally of what those migration stories are, what we then do is we take um, sometimes an hour, sometimes a day, right, or two days to then come back and write those um, write those out, and then we create broadsheets from them, broadsides, basically posters. So here's an exhibition from Laredo. There's, um, there's a whole collective manifesto project that I've been working on for years as well, but you can see on the back sides, there was one of these broadsides um, that was done, and then the migration stories written out from there. 
Uh, I'm going to share um, one or two um, more projects before we break up, just being conscious of time um, here as well. Um, some of you, I'm just going to trust, I can't see everybody's face here, but um, have heard of a place called Marfa, Texas, or maybe you haven't heard of it. But if you're involved in the arts, you probably have. Most people know it as a place that an artist named Donald Judd uh, ended up settling in uh, decades ago and created this whole beautiful, I mean, really amazing contemporary art spaces. Um, I have been to Marfa probably about 15 times over the past 20 years. It's a place that's been really meaningful to me. But a lot of the narrative is that, right, is that Marfa was this like, um, you know, really kind of like run down town, judge showed up, and then kind of then history goes from there. But what a lot of people don't know is there was actually a thriving community in Marfa for a very long time. One of those places in that community is called the Blackwell School, and this is a photograph of it here. And the Blackwell School um, has a hard history. Uh, during segregation, this is where Latinx students went, right? They were not able to study in the same school um, as, um, as white children were. And the, the school ran up until 1965. Some of you may be familiar um, with the story of the burying of Mr. Spanish. There was this moment where teachers had students write Spanish words down and they had they literally had a funeral for them and they were no longer allowed to speak Spanish in school. Um, the school closed in 1965 and the schools um, integrated, but in the past 15 years or so, there has been a really active um, group of community members, uh, the Blackwell School Alliance that has been not just preserving the building, which it actually just got recognized as a national historic site, which is incredible, um, but also bring together um, stories and other history of it. And um, they reached out um, to myself and Jason, um, Borderland Collective, and they invited us. They said, would you come and would you want to do a project with us? And we said, well, the first step in that is let's have a conversation. So we went out um, to Marfa and had an incredible meeting. And in that meeting, what we learned is that they, they had this amazing oral history archive. It had been done years before, but nobody really knew where the files were or where the transcripts were. So we got those together. Also, um, this is they had these amazing photographs that were there um, that people had already put up. This is the inside of the Blackwell School. So there was already some incredible things happening. And we decided, right, there was like, we don't really need to do anything except work alongside people to help tend what's here. So we began to organize the oral history archive and organize the photographs. But then we put out an open call to the community to continue to add to that archive. And so people started bringing in new photographs, right, and not giving the originals, but we were scanning because we believe that those photographs should stay uh, with families where they can have um, maybe more meaning. And then we also invited people to come in and to sit down and to record new stories, new oral histories for the archives. And then together we started to think about, okay, how can we begin to activate this? One way that I think about my art practice is all I do is activate archives, right? Um, sometimes those archives already exist and sometimes those archives are being made in creation with communities. And I often think about, right, this idea of like, how do you turn an archive inside out, right? Instead of waiting for somebody to come in, how can we begin to take the archive out into the community? So for this project with the Blackwell School, what we decided to do was to make mural sized photographs and to put them on significant locations around town. Kind of the, the original idea was to create like a, a, a whole walking tour. Some of the buildings that we were hoping to use, we were not able to get permission but some, you know, some incredible places came out. Like this is a photograph of the Palace Theater on the exterior of the Palace Theater. Um, this is some of, uh, you know, uh, graduates from um, across generations inside of Marfa on the outside of the public library. This is a photograph of the town of Marfa on City Hall on the side. And so we were thinking about what are these strategic locations that we can put images in? This is the only location that was inside. And um, and this was in the health clinic, and they agreed to leave their blinds open and leave the lights on at night so that people um, could begin to see it. And as we were thinking about it, right, so here's the images that are out in the community. We were also thinking about how can people begin to engage with audio. And so we ended up creating 12 separate audio tracks. Um, some of them were pulled from the original oral histories that were created um, years ago. Some were from the new interviews. And then also we did field recordings and brought those in. We found recordings from the um, Blackwell School Band and also from 
a conjunto group that wrote a song particularly like in honor of the Blackwell School. So there's, um, yes, there's some traditional interviews inside of there, but there's also some more experimental pieces. One thing, um, this project launched in at mid 2019 and was supposed to go till summer of 2020. I think we all know what happened at the beginning of 2020, right? Pandemic hit. And, um, you know, one of the ways that we wanted people to begin to engage with this audio was actually through the QR code, right? And through them being taken to a page where they could listen to the audio on their own device um, in that space. And so we didn't even know, I mean, it was, the exhibition was actually really set up. You could still uh, experience it totally distanced, but you could listen to that person talking about their life in that context that, that was there. So in that space. But another thing that we did um, is we didn't want to just have it to be something electronically um, that you use on your phones. So we created a newspaper as well. And when you open the newspaper, there's images and words from people, but then there's also a map of all the locations um, so that you can walk around and you can begin um, to see those things there. We had the, the launch of the project happened at a big annual event that the Blackwell School Alliance puts on. And there was about 5,000 of these newspapers that, that were then distributed throughout, throughout um, local businesses and family members and things like that. You can see some of the pictures here, right, are really large. And then I don't think you can, there's some, you can see some of the, uh, the transcriptions for some of the interviews as well that are there, so. Um, one thing I uh, was really reminded about inside of this project too, is that most of the time when you make something public, right, it's not just an end to it. It's not that that's the final thing. It can often represent a beginning. And so as people were coming for this community event, they were like, oh my gosh, I know who that person is, right? And talking about the pictures. And so we were prepared and had um, places set up that people could begin to record new stories um, to go into the archive. And this is an example. This was like the cousin of somebody who showed up uh, just kind of driving by and saw the photograph. And so we were able to then record that and add it back in. And I love it when those things begin to happen, right? You begin to learn so much more um, uh, about a project in those ways. Um, I'm going to share one last project and then we're going to go because this is actually another pandemic project and I wasn't thinking about adding this one in but before we go to breakouts. Um, I was invited to do a residency um, inside of a small town called Bartlett and Bartlett um, has long uh, complicated history but there's been a lot of resurgence in the community somebody's come up and bought a, brought, bought a bunch of property and so they created an artist residency to begin working um, with community members and when I heard about it I was. Uh, excited about it. I was, but we were, this is, you know, um, late 20 or summer of 2020, so deep pandemic time. And as I was driving around town, trying to think about what to do inside of this project when we were all still distanced, and I kept driving past the Willabelle nursing home and ended up learning that there was about 30 residents in this nursing home. Most of them had been in the area for a long time. And so um, ended up um, talking with administration and their families and people that were living there and decided that we found a safe way to be able to interview distance. And we created a set of 12 um, oral histories with residents that were there. But the way that we shared them out is actually created a, a small low power radio station. And the idea was that um, through this antenna that was installed here in the space, is that the um, the interviews were played out in a two mile radius over the town. And so the primary audience was for the community of Bartlett, but then also for visitors who came out to listen to those stories. And then there was also these um, little hand radios that you could check out inside of the space. And so then people were encouraged to check out a radio and then go grab lunch or go on a walk around town. And there was about a, it was about a six and a half, seven hour loop of the audio that was going uh, from that. And so, but I really love this, uh, the project of that. It. It's voices from the town of Bartlett that are then uh, put back and distributed through the town, through radio waves, and then not available outside of that community from there. Uh, there was also uh, other parts of it. I found there was this amazing 100-year uh, newspaper archive. So we did readings of stories uh, from the newspaper, um, did workshops with youth uh, about what was meaningful to them in their community, and it was uh, played out on it. And then there was this um, 
um, it was hard history as well in the community, but there was a site, a number of historical markers. And so we did readings of the historical markers and had them available on the radio station as well. Uh, part of this is uh, I've always been like low key obsessed with, with low power radio. And uh, so I've always wanted to create a low power radio station. So this is one way uh, to begin to do that work. So that is a lot of projects. We've just, I just talked on and on for about 45 minutes um, of that. And what I want to do is I want to take us back to that question that I posed for us. Oops, excuse me, let me see if I can get this text here. I'm going to go ahead and drop it uh, in the Zoom. Um, but the questions that I posed for us, right, is where have you had, let me see, get in here. Where have you had meaningful interactions with oral histories? Um, and why was it meaningful? So what I would like to do is I'm going to go ahead and put y'all into some breakout rooms and invite you to share out from that, right? Um, you know, share those meaningful interactions and places that you encountered. And I want to invite you to try to name what was meaningful for you, for you inside of that. What was it about that um, that, that, was, that was meaningful for you? Um, also, if you can't think of anything, that's totally fine as well. Um, you can share maybe something from the examples that I share from the community projects that we've done. I'll put you the, um, we'll do breakout rooms for about uh, 10 minutes. And then what I'm going to do is then I'll invite everybody. I say invite everybody, but I'll push the button that automatically closes the, uh, um, uh, the uh, breakout room. And then we'll all come back here and we'll have a time of sharing out and then also a time of questions. Okay. If you don't, um, you know, if you don't want to, um, go into a breakout room. That is totally fine. Um, just feel free to stay here and we can uh, then all join back in together. The way that I'm doing it is here. So we're going to do, um, uh, there should be about four to five people in each one of the breakout rooms uh, for that. Okay. Team, good to go. Is there anything that I'm missing or forgetting? Um, if you need anybody, if anybody needs an ASL interpreter, please let us know. And um, they'll make sure to um, uh, to join that breakout room. Okay. All right. Here we go. What I'm hoping that we can do now is just to take some time and to share out. You can uh, raise your hand. You can also just uh, we can popcorn it. But what did you just talk about inside of your uh, breakout rooms? What were some of the things that you shared or things that came up of where you had meaningful engagements with oral histories? And also. I'll say towards the end or as we kind of move through this, I'm happy to, to um, answer any questions about projects or elaborate on anything or anything like that. But would love to start us off with talking about that question. Where did you, have you experienced uh, meaning in engagements with oral histories? Somebody want to start us off? Natasha? Yeah, um, I just shared that uh, just a few weeks ago in Seattle, I, I participated in this um, multi-sided dance performance um, that was focused on um, kind of displacement, development, um, and gentrification throughout Seattle. And you had to like get on a bus and go to different sites for these performances. And on the bus, they were playing um, recently recorded oral histories oh. were relevant to the spots we were traveling through. And it was just like such a powerful um, and unexpected use of oral history. I'll drop the link in the chat so that people can see what this is, but Please do. It, was, it was really incredible. That's beautiful. And Natasha, was there like a printed um, like guide or uh, something that went along with it to help locate you and what you were hearing or what was happening? Yeah, there's, I actually have this right here. <laughs> it was like um, this huge map um, that had like different information. Um, so this is produced by artists and it, yeah, it cited places that were there and that had once been there um, and that were related to the information shared in the oral histories. Amazing. I love that. Yeah, if you will please drop the uh, the chat, drop it in the chat. would love to know um, about what that is. I also love the idea of the map folding out. Um, it looks like a beautiful object. I'm all about a good, good object. So thank you for sharing. What else? I can share. <laughs> Thank you, Fanny. I'm going to try to um, summarize what everyone 
mentioned, but um, Deb said that she had gone to um, the battleship Missouri at Pearl Harbor and Alcatraz and listened to oral histories in those spaces and that it was really powerful to do so, to be in the space and to get um, through headphones, the stories of people who had encountered those spaces at another time. Mm. And then Valandra mentioned that her ex meaningful encounters with oral history started at 17 wow. uh, when she wanted to interview family members, but then discovered that I think a grandmother, a great grandmother had already been interviewed by the Federal Writers Project which I thought was really cool. Yeah. And then Cassandra mentioned that she had interviewed her grandmother and subsequent for a project and subsequently lost the audio and was only able to retain the transcript. And she really um, began to then acknowledge and learn about the importance of the audio to be able to hear someone. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I talked about how um, one of my first really cool encounters with the oral histories was at the Museum of Chinese in America here in New York City, a very small museum, but they use their space really well. And I remember sitting on a couch and the action of sitting on the couch activated oral history oh, wow. or opening a drawer that activated an oral history wow. and pulling a book. And which goes back to uh, your um, your interest in objects and how that can trigger memory and uh, uh, create an experience with a story. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that, right? Of like, tri yeah, you're pulling something and then something comes out of there. Makes, you know, and sometimes um, I've also seen um, exhibitions where your you the audio is really targeted so even so it's like you walk into a space right and you could be inside of a room but all of a sudden you walk right over here and then you can hear it right and what it, I, I love some of those they have have a few speakers that, that can do that it's like a like almost like a sonar technology um but but also one of the things that happens inside of that is it's usually like really higher higher frequencies and not necessarily the lower part of someone's uh, voice so limitations inside of technology for that. So thank you, Fani. Uh, oh, one other thing I wanted to point out, and Jackie, then we'll, we'll come over to you. But um, I think, um, I can't remember who it was to share that, like losing the audio, um, right? And then realizing how important it is. One of the ways that I learn uh, best is through mistake. And so sometimes, right, I'll be doing something and I don't get a result. And then I have to figure out why I didn't get the result that I wanted. And it really pushes me, it motivates me, right, to really, really learn. And I've come to, I think when I was um, right younger or just starting off, I would be so frustrated with myself, right? Of like, oh, why didn't I do it this way? Why didn't I do that way? And I'm trying to live in a space where instead of that frustration, I'm really trying to embrace that and say, okay, because of this, like, what is the next thing that I need to do? And maybe that's something that's on the technology and that I need to gain some skills. Maybe it's about broadening my understanding of a subject matter, uh, or maybe it's, you know, just learning di different things, but kind of a shifting inside of myself away from frustration to, to one of growth. So, Jackie? Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. And I'll be brief in representing uh, uh, room 10, I believe it was, in, in room 10, my apologies for jumping in and representing. but. To me, the big takeaway from everyone sharing their stories was it's very, this, this interaction with history because it's oral becomes very personal. Mm. And, and, and I think in everyone's sharing, that was, that was my takeaway, regardless of what that encounter was. And, you know, it's, it's, it's called oral history, but it just as easily be called personal history because that's 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 just where you end up with it or at least that was as i'm listening to people sharing about that and and uh and and susie one of our group members so eloquently said that it, in her um interest and in doing of oral history she prefers not to use a video camera she prefers just to capture that audio and i think again that speaks to the intimacy of it and the person the, the personality that comes out and then it being personal in nature. So 
thanks room 10 i want you to know that's what i that's what i got from y'all thanks so much thank you um you know that question right that exists uh so often right of you know do you do audio do you do video um in those different ways i'm going to drop in a link to a really great project that does use visit video called the visiting room project coming out of angola um some incredible work there so uh let's go to we'll do amy and then uh diana yeah and thanks jackie for representing us i was one of the other things we were talking about is sort of how to take that personal connection that we make in an oral history interview and invite audiences then into that relationship, which I think, Mark, you're doing so effectively in your work. Like, how do we make audiences feel connected to and even obligated or responsible to our narrators? And I think I'm reflecting on my own encounters with curated oral histories when I've been asked to like to do something with my body or to share something in my own experience is oftentimes when I feel connected. So like curated experience where you're like walking while listening or um, I'll share in the chat this really neat um, uh, art project I got to be a part of called Being Slash With by the Nicole Canuso Dance Company. Also, I think a Oral History Summer School Network folks um, that was like, it was actually a Zoom encounter with a stranger wow. and there was a facilitator with and facilitator there and it just like got me totally out of my comfort zone and like having kind of surprising memories and hearing surprising things and I think that feeling of discovery that we have when we're doing oral history is part of what um, makes oral history curations impactful. Yeah Amy you used a word and it's really um it, the, the word that you use really is a, a lens that I view so much of my practice through, um, it, and that is invitation, right? Is how do we invite people in? And, and through that invitation, it's telling people like who we are, right? And why we're doing what we're doing and helping set up expectations about that and talking about some of the, the risks or, what, or some of the possibilities of it. And also, I think it's being honest with the unknown, right, of not knowing everything that could potentially happen inside of a project, but then inviting people into that. And that has been, as we think about, I have to think about posture, right? How do you enter a room? How do you enter a project, right? How, and I think the posture of invitation is one for me that's been really rich, right? Telling people what we're doing and why we're doing it, and then inviting them to be a part of that, of that process. Diana? Uh, yeah, well, first, thanks so much for such a great workshop. Uh, very inspirational to hear everybody's stories. And I was in a room, I don't remember which number, and um, we began to talk about the really what you're saying, that invitation, that, that collective experience, um, experience to invite people in to collaborate and to share their own stories. And in the case that I shared, uh, maybe some people know who are from New York or or perhaps you know Pregones, which is a tra Puerto Rican theater group. And way back in the mid eighties, they did a play called Migrants. And mm. um, it was in the South Bronx where, they're, where they still are located. And uh, so many people came out. And as soon as the play, which was great, was over, many people got up in the audience and just started to share their migrant stories. Um, and all, all of whom had in common that they were from Puerto Rico. Many had come over in the 40s and the 50s. And I found it very, very powerful because of the collectivity and the emotion that was in the room. And the, whole, the, the stage was no longer the theater. The whole theater was the stage. And that yeah. was so beautiful. And then um, Alyssa, I don't know if she'd want to share, but her, hers was also about a very immersive experience in Chicago. And I really loved hearing about that. Mm. And thank you. Yeah, of course. One of the things that makes me think about is that urge sometimes that we have to hold on to something, right? And that can be really good to preserve, right? And to, to keep. But then there's other times that there's something so beautiful about just being immersed in where you're at, right? And you maybe not even be able to recite back the words, but it's more of that, that sense of a feeling. It sounds like you're describing that in that theater performance. And I mentioned, you know, when I was showing uh, some of the images of the um, for migration stories and working with the youth and they were reading these excerpts and their family members win and there was this time for open and sharing right I felt that um, that pull inside of myself I was like oh I was like I want to be recording this I was like but no it's like 
the you know the presence of the microphone would change this whole the whole dynamic in the space and that's just where you like i hope in those moments right the deepest desire is just to live into that right that you can't recreate that and you just then take that with you into hopefully other events or other um, ways of working with people so what else In room 10, there was an interesting conversation, or 12, sorry. There was an interesting conversation. Um, so Yolanda had shared her story about um, interviewing family members and that being like an introduction to oral histories, which I feel like is, is a common, yeah, it's a common story. Um, but, you know, being Black for Yolanda, it was difficult getting these family members to speak their stories because they had lived through you know, a lot of the Jim Crow era, and obviously that's, yeah, so, um, and so it was really interesting, because she said that one aunt came over, and was, like, so happy to share their personal life story, and just the joy that they got from sharing, um, and so that was, like, a really meaningful moment for, for her, for her family, and, and then I had shared some of my experiences, um, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, and I had done a project where I was in Puerto Rico interviewing students and high schoolers about how COVID was difficult for them, especially with the technolo technological disparities um, and touching on like notions of resilience. And so, you know, we were telling our personal stories and I believe it was Denise. Um, she was talking about how she's leading this oral history project on her tiny island off the coast of New Jersey. And she made a comment that um, her her project isn't nearly as important as ours or her, her work isn't nearly as important as ours. Um, and I don't wanna speak for Yolanda, but you know, they very beautifully pointed out that all, all stories are important because they're personal and they're our own. And you know, being able to reclaim your own legacy, like that's what's important. Um, and so it was, it was a really, it was, it was a beautiful reminder and a beautiful kind of interaction to see, um, to be reminded that a lot of the work we do is important certainly by the nature of it being done and it being done because someone cares about it somewhat wants their story to be told and we are very privileged to be able to do that so you know shout out to to us i guess yeah that's awesome yeah. thank you for that beautiful reminder right um and yeah I'll, I'll just name this you know um some of the hardest projects that i've ever worked on have been with family members right um because it, there is that generational trauma that exists in so many of our families, right? And we can do a good job of, of avoiding that. But when you start poking around in it, right, you don't necessarily know where it's going to rub up against your own. And um, in, you know, the project Capricho, um, in that project that I talked about, um, that definitely was, was very challenging for a couple of family members, right? Because inside of six hours of um, recording, right? Of course, there was going to be things that were challenging, right? And periods of life that were deeply painful for other family members. And so it's, it was like navigating that was, was pretty tricky. And there were some things that I chose to not include in it. I had to cut some things out of the edited transcript, but I just felt like we're a little um, too raw for that space. Um, and so it's, it's, it is preserved in the full audio inside of it, but um, always having to navigate those things with the, the best tools that we have at the moment and each one of our stories is so unique, right? So also, um, if you have any other comments or questions, even about trauma and families, or if there's an experience that you have, invite you to to share that, to bring it to the space for us to to learn from. If I may, yes, of course. Hi. Um, uh, about that, I was thinking uh, I shared that to to the uh, very good ten room that we were uh, with other colleagues. Um, I worked with uh, with trauma a lot. I discussed with people. I interviewed people, uh, survivors of uh, two dictatorships, one in Greece and one in in Argentina. So, um, what I I'd like to you know to mention here is that. Uh, while I discussed with people that survived, uh, you know, tortured people that really 
found their way uh, out of this, um, not only physically, but also mentally, uh, is the, um, uh, the interviews of uh, perpetrators, of people that they were torturers. Mm -hmm. And um, our, um, I found very challenging uh, how to handle this because my father was a survivor, a tortured person. So I got to interview the person that actually, one of the people that actually tortured him. So um, I think that this is the moment that you understand that this is your part as an old historian is to, to record that, um, put yourself, let's say, not out of the equation, but put yourself in a different way in the equation. Uh, so you can record something which is very important to see both sides, even if, you know, either way, you, 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 we clearly, may, uh, I, I assume we have a, uh, a clear image uh, of the perpetrators and, you know, um, what they did and how we deal with them. But still, we have to listen to them and understand their, their mentality. Personally, if I, I, I find even more intriguing to listen to these people uh, because I want to understand how someone, you know, a person, nobody is, you know, is, is born a torturer <laughs> or a killer, I, I assume. Uh, in order to to go deeper and understand how how they can turn in something like that, and also how they 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 turn back again in normal life after that, in both cases. So, as a, as an example, but how trauma how important trauma is, and and I personally find it more than impressive how people, the tortured ones or the people that they actually uh, suffer for this trauma, uh, they keep on with their lives. Mm. I think this is the most something that you know after the uh, interviewed thousands of people still i cannot really feel how on earth can you forget something i mean you know you broke your hand 10 years ago and you still remember that yeah thank you for those words i think it's Thanks. important right? and it speaks uh, so much to the possibility of change right and resiliency inside of it i um i i've been working very closely with individuals on death row here in the state of texas for the past seven years and that work is, I mean, it's like a roller coaster, right? There's so much pain inside of it. And then there's also so much joy inside of the work as well. Um, two weeks ago, I was at a symposium at Haverford College, which is in Pennsylvania. And um, the scholar, uh, Nicole Fleetwood, scholar and curator was there. Uh, Nicole did this amazing exhibition called Marking Time that opened at MoMA PS1, looking, um, featuring artwork of individuals that are incarcerated incredible exhibition I encourage you all to check it out and nicole kicked off the symposium for us with some beautiful world words and showing up in vulnerability and she said that in this work um we show up how we can show up right and how we show up changes and i think that when you're doing that work around trauma and hard issues and you're immersed in it so costantino's coming back to being a a, a um, an interviewer inside of that and doing hundreds or, you know, of interviews, right? We show up to the work how we can show up, but also how we show up changes, right? And what we can do. And I think that um, it's important to show up and do that, but it's also important to recognize the trauma that comes out of that. How do we care for ourselves? How do we um, create into our project structures or um, like um, um, planning um, support structures, right? For the trauma that will emerge from that, we make sure that we have, um, whether that's professional help or a caring community that we can come to with those things as well. What else? I think I see Lynn's hand up. Yeah. Oh, I'm. thank you, Fanny. Yeah, Not Lynn. Today. Thank you, Fanny. <laughs> You know, the, the whole question of, of trauma, one of the things that's really struck me, um, and I appreciated you saying that, Mark, about transcripts and how transcribing and listening to audio and just typing the words out kind of pushes us to listen more deeply, I think. Um, but one of the things that's really struck me with the picture of the Homeless Oral History Project, and it started because I was trying to figure out when people say something and start laughing, should I put in brackets laughs, you know, and then, but there's so many different kinds of laughter and people, some of the folks that I've interviewed are telling these extremely traumatic stories and then they laugh, 
yeah. right? So it's not a laugh like it's really funny. It could be an ironic laugh. It could be just a absurdist. I mean, there's just so many different ways to describe it. And so that made me start thinking more explicitly about the meaning of trauma and what does trauma mean to the person that's experienced it. And for some of the folks that I've interviewed, for example, like police brutality, if you're homeless is normal, right? Yeah. Whereas others, another, yeah, or an, another person might experience it. They've never been in that situation before um, and they are horrified, right? Or they're horrified that it's normal. And so the meaning of trauma, I know as oral historians, we are in a lot of conversations and rightly so, about um, making sure we're we're doing this in the, in kind of in the context of care for narrators oh. and communities, but ourselves. Um, but for many of the narrators that I've interviewed, it's it's a motivation for them to get like politically activated, yeah. and so they see it not necessarily as it's harm, but then um, something that they like you, Mark, with mistakes have turned into something positive and a source of strength. And so that's kind of a place that I've, I've become very interested in is what are the ways that we make meaning out of trauma mm. um, and draw strength from it in a, and not just as individuals, but collectively. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I saw a couple of hands raised here pretty quick, so I'm going to uh, assume that it's a response to what you said. Uh, let's go uh, Valeria and then Walter. Hi. Well, actually, I was just going to talk about a little bit of what we spoke in our group. Okay. Uh, uh, about oral histories. Um, I, I'm i not an art historian. I I actually work as a, a art legacy consultant with um, artists and their uh, heirs and those entrusted to to steward artistic legacies. And, and my partner Carlota is here in, in the seminar as well. And, and one of the things that we discussed in our group was the importance of having these first hand accounts mm. uh, by the artists, their contemporaries, the people that work closely with them, and how that informs our understanding of an artist, a movement some mm. kind of um, uh, uh, impact, the impact that this has in other people. So for, for me, I, as a, just a recipient of oral histories and an avid museum goer, I had a relationship with oral, oral histories, but now on a professional level, I am also understanding the depth and the reach of these projects and these programs. And, it's just wonderful to be part of this community. <laughs> thank, oh, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Walter, good to see you. Yeah, hey, Mark. Hey. Um, so I, I'm the founder of the Texas After Violence Project, and we chose uh, oral history as a medium for uh, receiving the stories that uh, we, we archive and, and distribute because it's a cool, cooler medium than what we're surrounded by often in, in the media and the arts, uh, which are sort of often are upregulating stories about violence. And, uh, you know, our goal was to, was to uh, try to awaken our fellow Texans to the violence that we all commit, uh, we all participate in uh, when our state um, executes somebody or when our state tries somebody for the death penalty. I mean, the whole process. Um, and we wanted to awaken empathy without um, our stories falling into the usual pattern of just, you know, upregulating up those who watch them and, and just kind of sustaining the, the usual narratives and, uh, uh, you know, kind of being involved in, in violent repetition. Um, and it's, it's hard to get, you know, violence is, um, uh, is, you know, our violence is so traumatic that, you know, our reactions to it are, you know, denial, avoidance, and even dissociation to the point that we're not really aware of it. So we can actually be telling violent stories to each other, getting upregulated, but not really being aware of the consequences of it. And so we, 
we wanted to try to get through that. And um, we started out by collecting stories about uh, persons who'd been directly impacted by the death penalty. In my small group, I started to tell the story about when we were asked about, you know, how we were affected uh, or impacted by an oral history uh, at some point, I started to tell a story that I don't know that I can tell here because it's, but just the outlines of it are that I met somebody totally at random uh, who, you know, as I got to know them, they talked to me about having, uh, this is a Texan, they started talking about having had a, you know, almost 20 year relationship uh, with the death penalty case as it wound its way through the appellate courts and finally ended up with an execution. And in that, in the course of that process, that person had, um, had, you know, gone through a, a tremendous struggle and had been alienated from others in the process and was carrying shame and guilt and grief and, and, you know, the, the residual effects of trauma. And um, I said, I, then I said, well, you know, what case was that? And she told me, and I said, well, that's interesting because uh, the Texas Heritage Violence Project uh, received a story from one of the persons that you're talking about that you felt alienated from, you felt shame in front of and grief. And, you know, you, you, I was with this person in her office and I said, you know, we could just sit down and, and watch that story right now, which we did. And uh, uh, and sh and she she cried as she processed what she was watching, and that was probably the most profound uh, thing that's happened to me in the course of the project. Um, and you know, I had the thought after that evening that you know all this expenditure was worth it, even for just that one moment. Yeah, thank you, Walter. And you know that archive. You know, um, I mentioned earlier, um, Rebecca Lawrence is on this call as well, the former uh, director of TVP. And I remember one of the first times that I used the TVP archive was with the, um, the interviews of Derek and Keith Brooks, who were the children of Charlie Brooks Jr., who was the first person um, executed through lethal injection in the United States. And I used it in a high school um, setting, you know, with a, a group of 35 students who we were doing a year long project looking at capital punishment. And there was something, you know, Derek and Keith, we decided to do, use their oral histories instead of them showing up because they felt like there was so much uh, already more inside of, of that interview. And it just gave it, it was like a different layer of having that um, inside, of the, inside of it. And I really began to see the power of what oral history could do, right? If there's something totally different than somebody showing up and talking about their own experience, then seeing a transcript and being able to go back to it um, and so thank you for your work, Walter. What else? Let's see here. Diana? Hi. Uh, well, I just had a question of something you mentioned earlier. I really appreciate all the methodologies that you're sharing. I come out of this as a, uh, not an oral historian, but as a participatory media person, community media person, So I've and popular educator. So I've been doing this work for a really long time. Um, and I was very, and right now I'm working, I live in um, the North, North Carol, Northern California in Mendocino. And we're starting an oral history project here uh, with uh, the Mexican community, Mexican American community, which has been completely invisibilized, eradicated from public history here. Um, and so it's it's a project that's going to be slow going because I think it's hard to begin to share histories when nobody's ever asked you before, and you've actually been told that your history is not worth it you know, not worth anything. And so it's, it's, it's a very beautiful project. Um, I'm interested in the project, in the project that you asked that you began to talk about in terms of, um, I think you said it was in a library or maybe the art center where you invited people to come in and did a workshop on family archiving. Mm -hmm. And I was just interested either briefly, or if you could share a link just to talk a little bit about that methodology. Cause I think that would be something that would be very beautiful since the archives uh, don't exist here and people are going to have to create them and recreate them. 
It's a great question. And it really leads to this idea or leads me back to that idea of the toolbox. Um, and that that um, analogy really comes to me from the field of social work, right? Social workers often talked about you gain all of these different skills, right? Whether it's working, you know, micro or macro or groups or this, and you have all these skill sets, and then you get to choose or you need to choose when you use them, right? Because some of them you can't use together at the same time. They're doing whole different approaches or uh, methodologies. And so I love the idea of the toolbox, right? And then we come to it. And so for me, in my personal practice, right, I, I have my own toolbox of things that I use. And that's often starting off uh, with interviewing or it's using photography or it's using, um, I know the things that I have in my studio, right? I have um, you know, saddle stitch binding machines that I can take into a space or paper or the risograph. And so it's a it's about kind of looking at the resources that I have around me. And then also then my expertise or individuals that I can partner with to bring their expertise to then figure out what we can do together. So for example, um, at Mexicarte, we had scanners, we had um, uh, printers, we had staplers for binding, and we had all sorts of paper, and we had an audio recorder set up. And so the idea was that as people came in, we had one person came in with nothing, and they said, I just want to create something about my family. And so we said, okay, do you feel more comfortable writing, or is it something you want to speak? And they're like, oh, we can speak, you know, and do, and, you know, then they can sit down on the recorder and begin to work that way. Um, somebody else came in with like a box full of photographs, right? So they then ended up sitting down at the scanner and scanning those and they didn't even end up finishing it, but it was, it was enough of a, of like a, a push, right. To get their own project started inside of it. And so it's like, you know, um, I would love it if there was like a coder who had like, you know, VR experience, right. And could potentially be in the space. And what does it look like? to have somebody who wants to work on, you know, a family, you know, or history project, and then think about how that can be available in the virtual reality space. I've never been, in, you know, I haven't spent much time in that, but it seems like an, an incredible possibility. And I think it's looking at what resources do you have inside of yourself? And there doesn't always have to be huge financial resources inside of that. But then also, right, going back to the lens of in invitation, if you know you're going to do a family archive workshop, Right, who are the people inside of your networks or not even inside of them, maybe near you, who would potentially want to partner with you inside of that, right? And maybe the partnership is only a three-hour session. That's it. You know, that's all they ever contribute. But how can you invite people into that to bring their expertise to begin working uh, with families? And also, I really appreciate that you started that you named popular education because I think inside of those spaces, right, one of the things that we want to do is we wanna work against the banking model of education, right? That they're coming, we're opening up brains and we're putting information inside. When we recognize that we're all teachers, we're all learners, right? Somebody may show up and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, these are the tools we have. And they may say, well, I do embroidery. And you're like, what? Like, what would it look like to bring embroidery into that space? What would it look like to bring sewing? Or what would it look like to bring printmaking, right? From using fruit, who knows, right? But when we start to see workshop attendees or people inside of our projects, not as just people who are receiving, but that we're all, it's all reciprocal, that we're all learning and gaining from each other, just like we're doing right here, right? Everybody's bringing these ideas and I'm like making all my notes because they're things that I'm hoping to implement in a future project. But, but that for me is one of the core things. That's the foundation. That's the posture that we take when we enter into spaces um, and make work with people, not make work about people. And I think that that has been one of the foundational things for some of the projects. Anna. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana. Hi, Anna. Hi. So um, something really interesting that you just um, brought up that kind of reminded me of a pretty impactful experience I had within oral history was I, it was a VR event in mm -hmm. Miami because my brother-in-law does a lot of like VR and like XR technology stuff. So he ended up getting me a pass to kind of go to this like three-day event. So I passed by. And what was interesting was that uh, oftentimes it's kind of more geared towards like gaming, um, but this particular technology was being used by organizations um, working with oral histories. And one that was just like shocked me was um, a nonprofit, and I, I can't remember the name right now, 
but they were actually working within like the justice system mm. and working um, exclusively with domestic violence. Mm. So they were able, with permission of the families, to get access to 911 calls mm. um, when somebody called because of a d- domestic violence issue. Um, and this one in particular kind of puts you in the space of a trailer home. Mm. So you hear the beginning of the call, you see um, the family kind of come in and you are you don't ever go inside where the violence is, which mm-hmm. I think was a very good choice, right? To not yeah. necessarily visualize what the call, you know, recorded. Um, but it was such an intense um, experience because you're, you know, you're listening to this call. Um, and then there's like, you know, obviously interview after with the family members, but it was just like, I had never really seen that kind of technology geared towards that kind of storytelling before. Um, and I know there was a little bit of a conversation when I was there with like the people that, you know, had access to these calls and their intention and the ethical choices of using this kind of technology for these types of stories. But it was just something that really, you know, shocked me because it's not what I was expecting to see. Yeah. So, so thanks for sharing that, Anna. And sometimes I think about like what my 12 and 14 year olds are doing right now. I'm like, oh, that's going to be, that's, that's what we're going to be dealing with, you know, uh, in in a year. I mean, we're already dealing with it, right? But how do we look at the technology that's available to say yes to? And I think also sometimes it's like also making conscious decisions and saying, oh, if I say no to this, that allows me to say yes to other things, right? And being like, oh, I don't want to necessarily go down that route um, inside of it. And Anna, thank you. I'm going to drop, uh, Anna is an incredible artist and filmmaker who um, I just admire um, her work so much. I'm going to drop a link to Anna's website here in, in the the, uh, the chat. So thanks for being here, Anna. We got about maybe 15 more minutes as we're kind of starting to like land uh, land the plane here. So just want to, um, you know, just make us aware of that. If there's any other thoughts or questions, we can do it. I have a couple closing thoughts for us. Uh, Re- we'll go Rebecca and then uh, Susie. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hey, Rebecca. Um, hi. I guess, okay, hi. Um, so I actually, I'm, hi, Mark. Good to see you. Thank you for the inspiring words as always. And um, hi, Walter. I already said hi to Walter, my colleague <laughs> from Texas Chapter Bounds. Um, uh, I'm actually calling in from, I told my group, um, I was calling in from, from Juba, South Sudan, where I've, I've been living here for about 10 years, um, working at the University of Juba and also at an organization called Leaky Kiri Collective. And Likikiri means stories in Bari language. Um, and actually oral history is, um, you know, we've been kind of part of a pretty vibrant community here of people mm-hmm. interested in storytelling and doing a lot of things around um, narratives. And I came to this seminar because I, I, we've been building oral history archives over the last several years. I was fortunate enough to go to the summer school at Columbia University's oral history mm-hmm. Um, Summer Institute. So um, that was my original training. Um, And then through Texas After Violence built um, my skills. And then what I've been doing here is doing a lot of training with students, South Sudanese students um, and um, community groups. We've done projects with a group of widows and orphans um, from something called the Juba Massacre of 1992. Um, They wanted to create a memorial center Mm. and um, we kind of like took them through a process of, of, of collecting oral, oral his, uh, widows and orphans, interviewing them, them each other, and then creating um, a, um, an exhibit out of that. But I wanted some more ideas because we've actually been, uh, some colleagues and I have been invited to the Darfur Community Museum, um, who through a project received funding from the British Council to do cultural protection fund, um, something on living heritage. And I guess um, I'm finding this sort of challenging because um, there's been an assumption there about heritage being something that's, you know, it's this issue of, of frozen, frozen heritage and documenting it, documenting the heritage that's going to be lost. And so we've been kind of like going through methods and 
techniques to get people to <laughs> to 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 recover that idea of, of an attach personal attachment to heritage and what are the personal stories rather than experts in Darfur feeling like they want to go and do a, a, a universal survey of heritage in the area. And so anyway, oral history is one of those tools that we use to try to connect um, and, and try, but, I, but so the, 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 the leap to the exhibit, the leap to the activation in the audience and something that Amy was mentioning is where I'm still kind of like, this is a fresh project, it's new. So we're still kind of stirring the pot and trying to figure out um, what to do with it. So I came here with that question and I, I thank you for some of your ideas with the, the way the audiences create, like to create dialogues with audiences, but also it's the interviewers, like the people on the team of the interviewer team to get them to sort of like unfreeze the relationship to the heritage and to start talking in personal ways. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. You That's know, what right. is I, I ended up working on, on a lot of projects with, with young people. There's this project that's about to launch here in San Antonio where um, for two years, I've been working with over 400 high schoolers on building new monuments for our community. And one of the, the, the techniques that I use in, in working with them is I'm like, okay, let's have a brainstorming session. How, where could we place these or how could we get these out in the world? And they're like, well, maybe if we put them like on the corner or this, and I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'm like, gravity doesn't exist anymore. Like, let's imagine we're in this like total dream state. Budget is nothing, right? And so how do you get their brains? They're like, oh, we could put it on a airplane and fly it over. I'm like, perfect. I'm like, let's keep thinking, right? And what happens is it, and the ideas end up getting like really absurd and it kind of pushes us to a place where we wouldn't normally be. And then I'm like, okay, how do we take one or two steps back in, right? And then you're like, oh, that could be incredible. And then you're like, okay, what are the resources we need potentially to be able to do that? Do we need to raise money? Do we need access? Do we need this? And I think it's like, an, it can become this like really vibrant place when you take yourself to this like absurd possibility of ways that you could share things, but, but then come back in a couple of rungs and then try to work from those places. So I'm excited to see what ends up happening. Uh, Susie. Yes, I have a question on, I'm about seven months into my um, oral history project that I'm producing, and I don't know how to determine when I'm finished. It seems after I finish one interview, I have so many leads for another. Um, so how do you determine when you're finished? Yeah, that's, you know, one thing for me is I believe in iteration, right? So it's like you work up to a certain point and then you make something public and then you try to learn as much from that as you can and it shifts and shapes the work. Um, and then you go, you know, that's a way that I often work from that. Um, sometimes I often will also use exhibitions or talks or other things as kind of like a, a built-in deadline. Um, and so you kind of like have to kind of hit something. Sometimes there's a funding structure or a residency structure that, that ends that time. But I'm also not a very good person to talk about that with because what happens is I fall so deeply in love with who I'm working with and what's happening that it's almost like the project continues on for a long time, which is why I've been the artist in resident at TAVP for like 10 years. Every year we're like, this is the last year. And then we're like, oh, wait a minute, we got to keep working on this thing. And so, um, but I think that, you know, maybe one way to think about it is not when is the end, but when can you find periods of deep reflection on the work, you know? And so instead of trying to say, I'm going to end this, but like, can you name um, a retreat for yourself or a gathering of trusted um, colleagues who can help speak into the work, right? I think sometimes, you know, it's good. I'll ask some close friends sometimes. I'm like, can you be like super critical of this work? Like, where are the gaps or the holes that I'm not even thinking about and I can only ask that question, like a lot of times with people that I really um, respect and trust, right? That they can be really, really, really honest with it. And even just throw out possibilities. Like, I wonder if this is this area needs to be reworked um, to kind of think about it. But maybe, yeah, and I'm like learning alongside you, right? right? And it's like, instead of saying, when does this end, right? But trying to find the time for deep reflection on what you're doing and maybe even the person purpose of why you started the project is shifting and changing and it's not an end but a new beginning into something else that that comes forward from that okay thank you thank you 
It's a great question. Um, there are some more resources being dropped here into the chat, it looks like. Um, I wonder if there's a way that we can capture all of these and have them uh, along with the video. I don't know if in the recording of the check it's recorded as well. We can yeah, I'll, I'll make a bibliography and send it out. Oh, gosh. Thank you so much, yeah. Bethany. Um, I have a question, Mark. Oh, yeah, Fanny, go ahead. Um, in conversations with you, I really learned about how well you are able to pivot to pivot from one thing to another when a door is closed, when someone says no about something, when you can't find the right equipment for something, you just continuously pivot and pivot and pivot. And I really admire that about you. And in fact, whenever I talk about you, I tell people that, that that's like one thing I'm like gravitating towards. So I don't know if you can share about some of that because I think in some of the projects that that we've heard about, there are moments where there's a challenge that happens and how do you pivot and keep going? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. And yes, there are pivots always. I think that that's part of it. I could, we could do a whole nother workshop on like the top 10 mistakes that Mark has made inside of his practice and how he has had to pivot from that, right? and a lot of times how it's better, right? How the project are better, it's just different, you know, but there's a lot of meaning that's still located inside of that. Um, I think that I will just name one of the things about my personality is that, um, is that like, if I have a glass, I'm like, oh, this is half full, right? And it's like totally empty, <laughs> you know? But and so I do have a positivity about that that I've just had to recognize. Um, but so I think that inside of projects, I get really excited about them. And so when you start to walk down a road and then, um, you know, sometimes there's that block that happens and sometimes you then have to figure out, like, do you go over that roadblock, right? Do you begin to gather resources to try to push away forward or do you bounce off of it and go in a completely different direction? Um, but I think that like oftentimes what I'll try to do inside of those, um, and I usually have like a period of like mourning, right? You're like, damn, like I thought that this was going to go this way or whatever. But I think it's trying to ask myself, like, what is the most important thing right now at this stage of the process, right? Is it something where you have to like fight like crazy to try to get the project through because you believe in the participants in the project or what it is? Or can the thing that's really important at the heart of the project be completed in a, in a different way, right? Um, and, you know, one project, it's not even oral history related, but I was denied access by the state of Texas to work inside of a cemetery where um, individuals who die within the Texas prison system and their bodies are not able to be claimed by their family members for one reason or another, right, um, the, the state gives them a burial. And we had worked for almost a year on this project and were denied it, at it. And that was a way of like, having to make a decision about like, okay, do I gather my resources and try to shake the tree and get as many contacts to try to push this through? And it wasn't, right? What actually ended up happening is the project pivoted and I'm still working inside of the space, but doing something differently because what I realized is that the core of the project, right, was really just about getting people into that space and bringing awareness to a 20 acre, 22 acre plot of land that many people drive by every day and don't know what it is. But so it's like, you have to like, find those different ways that are that are there. And also, you know, looking to the, the team of people that you have, and sometimes that team of people is, um, is, you know, friends or family or just other colleagues. And I think like, usually when I'm at a place of pivot, it's like, that's when you turn on the listening to a different degree, right? And so it's like listening inside of yourself, it's listening to other people, because somebody may you know, have say something that all of a sudden sparks another idea or a way forward um, inside of that. But I think the pivot can be so hard, um, but also can be so good inside of that. Um, yeah, and I think I'm trying to do better about those grieving moments as well. And sometimes that can be an hour, sometimes it can be a day, sometimes it's a week, you know, that you take it forward where you're like, oh gosh, like, this didn't necessarily go the way that I was hoping or the way that I was planning. And sometimes it's that little shift, sometimes it's a hard no, so.
Um, Fanny, I think you missed your shout out earlier when I started. I've really appreciated getting to meet with you so regularly over this past year. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Yes, I did miss it. I was having connectivity issues, but um, I'm so glad that you got great to group. share your, your trajectory and your projects because these are really great. Thank you. I'm grateful you're here. Um, well, as we're starting to wind down, um, if there's any last thoughts or anything that you have, I invite you to drop it into the chat or any other links. And um, thank you, Bethany, for being willing to pull um, those things together. But I want to take us back a little bit to what I, something that I started off with and I've talked a little bit about, but is this idea of the toolkit. First off, if there's anything that, that you have seen inside of any projects that I have done or Borderline Collective we have done or TVP, we just want to say openly name that you are free, they are free and available to, for you to use. You can take those ideas and implement them into your own practice, and you do not need to uh, get permission from us to do that. I think that oftentimes we try to hold on to things so much, especially I come primarily out of a contemporary art context where originality is, is the highest form, right? It's like you have to always be original, and I think that there's something um to be learned from this sharing right and opening up our hands with these tools to be able to do that so you can do it but I, one other thing um that i really like about the tool analogy is that when you pick up a tool for the first time nobody ever assumes that you know how to use it perfectly right you sh it's you shouldn't it, first time you do something or use something it's not going to be perfect right and you learn and you iterate also with a tool um, right, you can build something, you can give a tool away, you can share, you can have a tool library, right, where you lend things out and do that. Um, so I think that there's just all different um, uh, kinds of ways of thinking about that. But um, yeah, there's some things coming in here into the chat. Um, Jackie, it's a low power radio station. It's basically the same technology we used to use when we had CD players in our cars, um, right, and it would like broadcast it to an FM station. Um, so there's, they're um, technically called FM tuners, I believe, is what they are. And so you can set up, set up a um, station. They're also highly illegal. Um, the F FCC, FAA, FCC will shut you down um, if you do that. So just a warning, there's laws around that. And just decide what you're comfortable with inside of it. I felt that in a rural area that was really lifting up um, uh, individuals in the community, I was totally fine with the FCC coming by and telling me to turn it off and then having to deal with the consequences for that. So, um, any, Amy, any last thoughts or Bethany, any last things that we need to do, um, as we, uh, land us here and move us to the rest of our day? No, thank you so much, Mark. This is really great. I loved hearing from you and from everybody. Um, about projects that have inspired you coming away with so many ideas. And thank you, Bethany, for making a little bibliography for us out of this. That'll be super useful. Um, the video of this will be up on our website shortly. Um, and in the chat, I shared a link to the page where all the past videos are. We have one more workshop coming up in May with Rochelle Kwan, which I think will very much complement our workshop today. So definitely encourage all of you to check it out. Thank you, Fanny, for recommending Mark and helping to make this workshop happen. Um, and yeah, no, just that thanks to everyone. Yeah, thank y'all. Um, also, I dropped my email in the chat. And also, um, my website is just my name. And so please stay in touch with your projects or get in touch. Um, I'm always down for a good 30 minute brainstorming session. Uh, so let me know if uh, just, yeah, I would love to know about your projects as they move forward.